We are so excited for you all to be joining us today. My name is Corey Woods, and I am on behalf of the Gardening for Life leadership team. We are so humbled and awed by all of you, truly. This is an amazing event. And when they talk about it takes a community, this event would not be happening with each and every one of you here coming as attendees and supporting it as a volunteer in so many different ways. So, I mean, this is our entire community showing up, which is a pretty amazing, extraordinary thing. So we're very touched that you're here and, and welcome. At the heart behind Gardening for Life is this idea that we can all make a difference in our own yards, that protecting and preserving the foothills in the Carolina in this region is so important and that we have a responsibility to do it in our own yards. And I think that's what we're here talking about today and all of our exhibitors. So again, thank you for joining us. Beyond all of your participation, some really important folks helped us make this happen by financially believing in this event, believing in the importance for our community for this and supporting it. So I want to give just a quick shout out to some of our lead partners. And you can go on our website and you've certainly seen them here as an introduction. But Conserving Carolina has helped us from day one. We're so grateful. And we all hike on their property all the time, right? So we're so grateful that they're here and making a difference. The Congregational Church of Tryon, from the beginning last year, helped to make this all happen. We're hugely grateful to them for that. New View Realty, Kloss and Walters Real Estate. These folks said, we believe in this. We're going to support you. Champions for Wildlife, Anita and Larry, Anita Salman and Larry McDermott. These are all folks who have said, yes, we want to help. And our Carolina Foothills, on and on and on I could go. But thank you very much for supporting this. So our speaker today, yeah. Our speaker today comes from Ohio. Jim McCormick is a botanist. He's a photographer. He's, to say he's a birder is not accurate because he's an expert on that. He's an award-winning author. And I have to say, what his, my favorite book is the book that we have today, which is Gardening for Moths. And who knew like how important that was? It is my favorite gardening book. I had an opportunity to spend a little bit of time in the woods with him since he's been here. And he is like a little kid when he gets out in the woods. I'm telling you, I am so excited that he is here, that he's come this distance, that he's sharing this message. And this is really going to be a treat for all of us because his photography on top of everything else is amazing. So please join me in a warm Polk County welcome for Jim McCormick. Very nice. Thank nice you. Meeting. Thanks, Corey. That was a very, very nice introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Klieg lights are on me. I hope you can see me. Um, this has been a real treat. You know, uh, this is uh, one of the most beautiful parts of the country, and the uh, biodiversity is amazing. So I've been, you know, in between other things, exploring a little bit, and was out this morning shooting. Uh, Trilliums that I'd never seen in flower before. That was really cool. Uh, but, you know, by the way, there's like, I don't know, 600 people in here. This could be the largest group ever assembled to come specifically to hear about moths. <laughs> uh, who would have guessed? Anyway, so, yeah, uh, uh, a wonderful co-author and writer and photographer in her own right, Chelsea Gottfried, and I wrote this book that came out last year. And our publisher was Ohio University Press, and I really want to thank them because not many publishers probably would have had the nerve to publish this thing, you know? Uh, but they did, and not only did they publish it, they did a really fantastic job. Um, it's available at fine booksellers everywhere or right out front at the end of the uh, event. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the book, but not really directly the book. What I, my job here is to make a case for moths. Why are they important? Like, who cares? Which is what a lot of people would think. 
Uh, and hopefully I can change any minds that might wonder about this. Hold on a second. There we go. Okay, the last time I was down here it was 2019. I was leading a photo workshop, and that's the Devil's Courthouse, you know, an hour or so west to here up on the Blue Ridge Parkway. And it was a good time, but it was about three weeks before this, earlier in March, beginning of March. And gosh, what a difference three weeks makes, uh, especially up in this part of the world. Uh, not a lot of flowers to look at on that trip. Now everything is popping like crazy. This is such a good time of year because things literally explode to life. All the way down here, when I would stop, I would hear these mountain chorus frogs singing, the males, they're in full breeding mode right now. If you were to get under the water, I'm a big fish photographer and I love fish, cut my teeth on them early in my career in biology. Uh, the darters, the little perch on the bottom of these streams, you have a lot of species down here. The males turn these just amazing colors this time of year, breeding colors. Um, the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge, which a lot of you know over in the eastern part of the state, tens of thousands of pintail winter there, but they're, they're bailing out, you know. Their winters come to an end, and they're going on to the prairie potholes of the north. Great horned owls are, um, have owlets already. It's one of the first birds to nest. <clears throat> And the warblers, if you're a birder, like this is the favorite group of songbirds, they're pouring in. I heard yellow-throated warblers, Louisiana water thrushes, black-throated green warblers today. And within the week, the first northern perulas, our smallest wood warblers, they'll be back. This one's in an apple tree. Uh, migratory red bats are streaming through. I'm going to talk about bats later because we would not have bats in this part of the world were it not for moths. Uh, but anyway, a little tip, you see the little beech trees, they retain their leaves over the winter. They're still on the trees now. Watch carefully for anomalies, little dark red looking leaves. The red bats roost in the beech trees in migration. And this is the time of year. Uh, won't be long, leave down here probably already, the little kit foxes will be out um, playing around. And on it goes, but this is a botany group, and I'm going to talk a lot about plants because uh, there's no way around that when you talk about moss. But the wildflowers are coming to life, hepatica, uh, up my way, the blue-eyed Mary in droves. It's just coming to life now. Uh, this is a really rare trout lily in Ohio, the golden star. But the yellow trout lilies that are similar down here, they're in bloom now. They're already fading out in trilliums. Oh, my God. You, some of you would know this, but North Carolina has uh, 18 species of trilliums have been found here. Only one state eclipses that. Does anyone know, know what state that is? Tennessee. Tennessee has 20. This is the trillium epicenter of the world. And I got to see two new species to me here over the last few days and photograph them. This is the large flowered trillium, which is common down here, too. Um, it's going to snow again, I guarantee you, at least up at the Northlands where I live, um, but it doesn't last long, you know. Winter's um, dying, basically, and we're coming into spring and, and moth season and many other things. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about birds, too, uh, eastern bluebird there, uh, because moths are, like, absolutely vital for birds, songbirds especially, and I want to talk about the big picture of moth importance. So here's the ostensible range of the book from the front of the book, and it covers parts of nine states, but uh, here's us. Like, I had to draw the line somewhere, all right? <laughs> you know, I wish, had I known about this when we were doing the book, I would have made it come down here. But basically, uh, <laughs> now no one will buy one. We're not in it. Um, just keep in mind always with political, artificial political boundaries, no animal or plant respects those. They mean absolutely nothing to a moth or a plant. Uh, but that's not very far south, and virtually every plant that we profile in the books is down here in this part of the world. I've seen a lot of them already, so um, whatever. <clears throat> this is from the front of the book. Uh, the bottom line is all butterflies are moths. This is from an entomologist, Akito uh, Kalhara, from the University of Florida. And he's exactly right, and I'm going to explain why that is. This is the great uh, or family order Lepidoptera, moths and butterflies. And 
Butterflies are just little pikers in this world. They're um, trivial, almost by comparison to moths. Uh, you can't get around this. You know, we've, we've done a number on the environment. There's just no two ways about this. And in my state, I'm just using mine as an example. You could use these similar stats for probably all states, at least in the east. Um, one third of our flora is imperiled now, officially uh, imperiled. It's on the DNR state list of uh, rare plants. And most of it's due to habitat destruction, loss of habitat. There's some other factors, too. Uh, so uh, it, it really is cool to see people waking up to the fact that even in our own yards, we really need to help out here, do things to bring things back. So I, this just summarizes what I really think is important here with plants. Native plants spawn moths or other animal life. Non-natives do not, or very little. You can't even compare the two. It's total apples and oranges. If we want animals, moths in this case, we have to have native plants. There's no way around that. So I've been on the speaking circuit a long time, and I speak a lot on plants and botany, and uh, many times it's to traditional gardening clubs. And they do a lot of good work, and I really enjoy those, but a lot of times I'm on the slate with other speakers and more traditional gardeners. And I've heard variations of that so many times, and every time I hear, do it, it's all about you sort of stuff, I'm like, why? Why is it always all about us? This is the root of our problem here. And uh, here's what we do if it's all about us. We wipe out a place like that, and then we name it epitaphically, Whispering Oaks. <laughs> They're gone. They wipe the oaks out. This is all over the place. You can find examples of this stuff. Uh, in my part of the world, especially, not so much down here, but the breadbasket of America, the Midwestern states, uh, uh, farming. Uh, my state, two-thirds of Ohio is agriculture. These former prairies that were some of the richest ecosystems on Earth uh, converted to a crop of three, beans, corn, and wheat mostly. John Deere, 1837, he launched a steel chisel plow, and this all changed overnight. Prairies now, this is a former prairie area. I took it from the airplane once when we were doing a flight um, north of Columbus, Ohio. 99.9 um, .9 plus percent of all of those prairies are gone. That's what we do. This is a worst case scenario. If you're a moth, this is my fair city of Columbus, the other Columbus. It's bigger than this Columbus here. Uh, so, you know, that's virtual, that complete habitat destruction. And um, uh, I'll, furthermore, if you're a moth, the light pollution is really bad. You've all heard a moth to a flame. They are attracted to light. No one really knows why, by the way. There's competing theories on that. But anyway, that's a, a sink for a moth. If it flies into that, um, it's not going to get out and reproduce. So that's what we do, but this is what we can do. This is my little yard, a little more than a third of an acre in Worthington, Ohio, classic suburbia, and I try and do my part. I whittle away at it. You know, you, I, I want to be on good terms with my neighbors, most of who mow diamond patterns into their grass and things like that. <laughs> then there's me over here. But I'm friends with them all, as far as I know. Uh, one trick I've learned is whittle away. Just take more grass, little by little, every year, and they don't notice, you know? And <laughs> someday they're going to look over and go, hey, Jim has no grass left over there. Um, but that year, it was heavy on the purple cone flowers. But you should see the backyard. It's fenced in. I do whatever I want back there. And it's a wildlife sanctuary, basically, in uh, suburbia. So why care about moss? This is a big question, and this is what I really want to talk to you about today, the importance of it. And uh, you can read these points yourself. I would just point to the middle one. That's probably the most important. They are absolutely critical parts of food webs in amazing ways, and this is where I'm going to spend most of my time on. Furthermore, the plants that they use, native plants, of which there's just legions of fascinating ones out there to be purchased, um, <clears throat> are easy to grow, and all of them spawn moss. Some more than others, but all of them will produce moss. 
So lepidopterans, we go back, we're going back almost 200 million years here, the order, epi, uh, le, ep, order at Lepidoptera. It's been around a long, long time. Uh, 180,000 or so species thus far described. That's only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I'm sure there's at least double that number and probably a lot more than that that haven't been described. A lot of moths, especially micro Lepidoptera, these tiny moths, um, way more out there that haven't been found. But anyway, of what we know of now, 20,000 are butterflies, 160,000 are moths. That's what I meant. That's what Kirohito meant by his comment, you know, um, all moths, all butterflies are moths. There's really not a lot of difference. Moths, our butterflies um, diverged much, much later, 55 million years ago. So they haven't been around nearly as long. They haven't evolved nearly as much. They haven't diversified near to the degree of moths. Moths are doing more heavy lifting is the upshot of that slide. The problem with moths is their reputation. It's not stellar. It's not like butterflies. We could fill this auditorium probably many times over with flowery butterfly prose like that. All of it flattering. There is no, I've not read an unflattering poem about a butterfly. And there's, it's not hard to see why. These are spicebush swallowtails uh, pollinating pinkster flower. Azalea, you have that here. There's two species, they look very similar. Uh, and swallowtails might be the only pollinator of pinkster flowers. Um, they're really drawn to it. And they're diurnal. You know, people can see them easily. They're showy, they're colorful, and uh, that's why people like them. Here's a painted lady on white heath aster, a common native aster. They release this species at weddings on occasion in mass. Show me a wedding where they're releasing moths in mass. <laughs> Here's moths. Some of you have seen this movie, Silence of the Lambs. Anthony Hopkins, Hannibal Lecter, Hannibal the Cannibal, dark movie. The totem was a death's head hawk moth, a moth, you know, not a butterfly. Uh, that's the kind of imagery that moths tend to evoke and be used for purposes like that. Now, it isn't hard to see why that might be. This is a black witch moth. It's a tropical species. It wanders to North Carolina and points north, but it's mostly uh, Rio Grande Valley of Texas and points south, but this is the size of a huge bat. This is a whopper of a moth. And, uh, you know, I'm making them look scary with my photo there. Um, they really aren't that scary, but a Spanish name, which I will bungle, sorry, but it's Mariposa de la Muerte, the butterfly of death. Or, it's a moth, you know, no one names a butterfly a butterfly of death, it's the moth. The legend has it if one of these flies into your casa and flies around the room, someone in that room will die. <laughs> I'm like, they're all gonna die eventually. It's meaningless, well, I think they mean fast, they're gonna die fast. So, this is what we got, oh, here, here we go. <clears throat> That's Mothman on the left. So Mothman was a mythical Lepidoptera yeti of some sort that flew around the Ohio River Valley in the 60s, was implicated in the collapse of the Silver Bridge that spanned Point Pleasant, West Virginia to my state, Ohio, and a number of fatalities in that horrific collapse. But moth, a moth was implicated in this, Mothman, not Butterfly Man. And there, over there, on the right, is Mothra doing battle with Godzilla in a Japanese sci-fi movie. So here's, you know, we're starting in a hole here, basically, with the reputation. But that's unfortunate, because they really are really cool beasts. I'm going to show you a lot of neat photos of moths here. Uh, and they can be very cute. Look at that. Now, wouldn't you want that in your yard? You could have that in your yard. This is an oak specialist, one of the myriad oak specialists, and they're really common. They're around us right now somewhere. <clears throat> Another thing I want to share that is really interesting are the caterpillars. This is a, we're face on in the grill of the, cater, of the caterpillar, the moth I just showed you, a white dotted, white line, the white dot line. And uh, that's its head right there. So what this is, is botanical mimicry. Botanical mimicry is incredible in this world. These are animals that live their whole lives, in most cases, around plants. This is 
bird defense right there. When you, you know, this is against visual predators to make it hard to see them. That's a big caterpillar too, and it plasters against a twig and just sits there all day long. A titmouse could land on that and not even know what he had, this big meal, and then they become active at night. <clears throat> Here's another cutie. This is a uh, tulip tree silk moth. One of the, uh, the silk moths are a favorite, especially amongst newer mothers because they're big and they're flashy like that. They're short-lived. They only live a week, maybe, as an adult. They have no functional mouth parts, and they don't feed. They only live to, to mate, to find a female and mate, and if it's the female, drop the eggs. They're uh, alive much longer in that stage, the a caterpillar, and that's a caterpillar of that. It's a spectacular bag of goo. Uh, one thing I've learned about photographing animals over the years is look at them from all angles. So that's the mug shot, the side view. That's the back end. It's a smiling unicorn. Who would have thought? So not all mouse are flashy, and this one is not. Now, a lot of people will know the zebra swallowtail butterfly. They're out already. They're just starting to fly, and they're a pawpaw specialist. We all know that. This is a pawpaw specialist. There are a number of species of moths that are pawpaw specialists, way more than there are butterflies. And this is one of the core ones. It's a big animal. The sphinx moths usually are, but it's not what I would call flashy. Look at its larvae. That would win a larval beauty pageant. You can't even make this up. They almost luminesce. It's as if they're lit from within, and it's got a blue tail on, on top of everything else. It's the reverse ugly duckling tail. It's really common in this world, where they grow up to be much duller than they are as, as larvae. That's a walnut sphinx, almost a specialist on walnut trees, but they'll eat hickory as caterpillars as well. This one's on the bark of a black walnut tree, what they usually eat, and there's its caterpillar. So <clears throat> this is a sound-making caterpillar. This is very rare in this world. Um, if attacked by a bird or some predator, it hisses loudly, really loudly. Uh, caterpillars have rows of holes, air exchange holes, down the side called spiracles, and it can force air out of those spiracles with such velocity that it uh, is audible six, seven feet away, and it thrashes violently like a snake when it does that. So it sounds like a snake hissing, and it looks like a snake thrashing. Total bird defense again. If you're a little uh, chickadee, you know, enough is enough. You might move to easier fare. I learned this the hard way. Uh, when I found one of these, and I didn't know what it was at the time, and I put it in my hand to move it to a better spot for photos, and all of a sudden it starts hissing really loud and thrashing in my hand. I let go of it uh, instinctively, and then I could hear it easily down there on the ground, six feet under me, you know, just thrashing around. It's really amazing what birds drive in terms of defense in this world. This is the largest regularly occurring moth <clears throat> that we have. It would be pretty common around here, the Cecropia moth, and it's a giant, and they stick out pretty well if they happen to land on your wall, but when they're in the leaf litter, and I'm going to talk about leaf litter, how important that is, but uh, they blend in quite well. Look at its caterpillar. I mean, that's right out of Dr. Seuss. <laughs> really amazing. Um, they're not, some of these are, you know, uh, I should say this now, if you see a caterpillar and it has spines, don't handle it unless you know what it is. A lot of them are envenomating. They don't just prick you, they actually have sacs of venom at the base of the spine and operate like a hypodermic syringe, and if you trigger it, it shoots the venom into you. It can be very painful. This one doesn't do that. I think it's just the shock and awe method of predator deterrence. It looks like something you wouldn't want to eat if you're a bird or touch. This is a Harris's three spot. Now, if we're manning mothing sheets, you know, we're out at night with lit sheets to attract moths and see what's in the area. This is a holy grail moth. This will bring the hardcore mothers over, in my part of the world at least, to see the Harris's three spot. Bizarre looking thing. And by certain turns, it's incredibly spider-like. And spider mimicry is a thing, you know. And this, some moths really look like spiders because it's a good defense. A lot of things don't want to tangle with spiders. Uh, but look at that caterpillar. <laughs> yeah, I can't even make it up. So certain angles, it looks like a fresh bird dropping. 
bird dropping mimicry, as I'll show you, is really common in the uh, animal world, the invertebrate animal world. And this, this does that. It looks all slimy. But what really stands out are the head capsules that are retained on the seti, those long hairs over the head on the right side of the photo. Uh, <clears throat> Caterpillars grow through molts. The bigger ones usually have five molts. I'll show you how this works in a minute. But somehow this Harris's three-spot caterpillar, when it molts, it retains the old head capsules stuck to those hairs. And the head capsules are like football helmets. They're really hard, chitinous, and very durable. One of the worst enemies to a caterpillar are parasitoid insects, flies and wasps. There are legions of them. And they land on the victim, and they lay eggs on it, or even punch, punch them into the victim. Your fate then is to be eaten alive by little grubs. You're doomed. When this feels something like that land on them, it whacks them with the football helmets and knocks them off. That's the purpose of that. This, this is a, real, a beauty, this big cinnamon-colored silk moth, the regal moth. It's one of the coolest moths out there. and uh, It has a heck of a bag of goo that goes with it, this. This is called a hickory horn devil. This is also common in this world where the moth, regal moth in this case, the caterpillar goes by a different name, hickory horn devil in this case. And they usually do eat hickory, but they eat walnut as well. This one's eating a walnut. I took, this is in situ where we found it one night. And you could hear it crunching the foliage five feet away. We're talking a big caterpillar, big larvae here. It's often compared to a hot dog. You're like, yeah, a hot dog sized caterpillar. Right, oh, Jim. There you go. No caterpillar was harmed in the making of this photo. I will say as a photographer, I have a simple credo, no one dies, all right? Now, a guy did have to run into town to get me hot dog buns, so Jeff White. I'm really appreciative he did that. I always wanted that. But that is a big, big caterpillar. Just think, if you were a kinglet, a golden ruby crown kinglets are coming through here like crazy. Now, there's no way you would even think about eating something like that. It's way bigger than you are. Well, the moths themselves, though, are hard to see. Most, the vast majority are nocturnal. Not all of them, but most of them. And the botanical mimicry is extraordinary in this world. This is a gray patch prominent. That's its head on the right. They're stick mimics or broken nubbins, you know, of branches type mimics. And no, good luck seeing that when it's at rest, even if you're a sharp-eyed bird. This one does it even better. That's a white blotch heterocampra moth, and that's its head on the left. And it'll just get on the end of a branch that's similar in size to it and sit there all day. The moth even looks like it has wet algae patches on it, just like twigs in human environments form commonly. It's really a remarkable camouflage. And they sit there all day like that, come out at night, of course, to feed and find mates. Then you have this. This looks like a Lepidopteran teletubby. It's pink and yellow. So you're like, how are you going to hide from anything? You're like pink and yellow. I mean, you stick out like the proverbial sore thumb until you see this. That's a rosy maple moth on the freshly emerged Samaras, or fruit of red maple in spring. Uh, beautiful synchronicity between the emergence of those and the first hatch of this moth species. Then you see maybe why they're pink and yellow. So anyway, in the region I showed you in that map, which should include this part of North Carolina, but it doesn't, um, <laughs> we have no idea how many moths are. No one does. Um, I've talked to a lot of people about this, and there's just no way of knowing. 10,000, but it's probably way more than that. I'm going to give you a case study that will show that. So there's a lot of moths, way, way, way more than there are butterflies. <clears throat> Now, the butterflies, if we had done a book on butterflies of Ohio, I'll just take my home state, we could tell you to the species how many there are. You know, 140, roughly. This counts the vagrants that have shown up there just a couple times. If you were a hardcore butterfly in the state of Ohio, you could probably find 100 species of butterflies, if that's what you devoted your year to. Um, so we know them very well. We really understand our butterfly uh, fauna. 
This woman we profiled in the book, she's really remarkable, Diane Brooks. She lives in southeastern Ohio, 12 and a half acres. By her own admission, a very ordinary habitat, mostly wooded for southeast hill country Ohio, which is part of Appalachia. She got interested in moths about 11 or 12 years ago and became fanatical about them. She has uh, sheets up and lights, any, basically almost every night it's above 50 degrees and has this huge database for 12 and a half acres. She's approaching 1,500 species of moss on that one piece of property. This, this show, if we had a Diane in every county, in every state, you know, in that book's map, it would be way over 10,000 probably. We just don't have people looking at them. They're, they're very poorly understood compared to butterflies especially. So what do they do? This is the big question, and I get this occasionally. What, usually it's framed like this, what good is that? <laughs> I don't mean to be sexist, but I'm referring to my own sex. It's usually a guy who says that. No. Next, yeah, well, yeah, girls too, I guess. But um, I always want to say, what good are you? But then that'd be really rude, so I don't do it. I never have. Anyway, they do ask, and people wonder, it's a legitimate question, actually. What, do they all do? What good are they? What are they doing? That's what I'm going to talk about. So, one, they carpet bomb, reproduce. It's the best way of putting it. So this happened on a door, a place I used to live. Salt marsh moss, really common species. Female on the left, she just dumped 700 eggs. That's how many are in there. She might go out and lay more. Some female moths will lay thousands, several thousand eggs. This tells you one thing with utter certainty, that level of fecundity or reproductive vigor, they're getting eaten like crazy. You have to do this to get a couple of them back through the gauntlet, the predatorial gauntlet, to reproduce themselves. This tells you they're an epic part of the food chain, just that picture right there. So, a little Lepidopteron 101, uh, it's a perfect metamorphosis, a four-part life cycle. We'll run through it really quick. I used hickory horn devil eggs, the hot dog caterpillar, because they're so big you can see them pretty well. Um, the dark eggs, those are little caterpillars, 10 or 15 minutes from eating their way out of the egg. One already has on the bottom left. Uh, this is what a, caterp a hickory horn devil looks like, 10 minutes out of the egg. I don't care how sharp your eyes are, you probably wouldn't recognize that as a caterpillar. We're talking two to three millimeters in length, just an utterly tiny little thing. But they're eat, they, all they do is eat, and then it comes out the other end. By the way, caterpillar poop is called frass. It's got its own name. So they're eating machines, and they grow like weeds. <clears throat> and, and to grow, they molt. I switched to another species that more dramatically illustrates a molt. This is a black wave flannel moth caterpillar, and the, it molted out of the white one. The white form looked completely different, like a different species. Some of you of a, an age would remember these old troll dolls you could get with the wild green or white hair. That's what they looked like in it. Then it molts into something that looks like a turtle covered with shag carpeting that's brown. <laughs> Uh, totally different, but the upshot here is it's way bigger, the brown one. They grow tremendously through these molt stages. <clears throat> so back to the hickory horn devil. This is a third instar. Each stage is termed an instar in caterpillar speak. So in the third instar is a really big caterpillar now. It's not that three millimeter long thing anymore. You would easily see it except it's more botanical mimicry. This one is on a walnut leaf, and it just lays there, coiled up during the day, and it looks remarkably like the old flowers of walnut that fall off and land on the leaves and desiccate and coil up on the, the leaf. So it's hiding in plain sight, much bigger caterpillar. This is the penultimate instar, next to last, and now you wouldn't miss it. I saw this through the windshield of my car driving. I was going pretty slow, but I look up, there's a hickory horn devil up in a hickory tree and now you won't miss it. It's massive, and then as we all saw before, it molts into this just utter behemoth of a caterpillar. Um, the, the amount of biomass increase between that first shot I showed you to this is like more than a blue whale uh, half would be, you know, as opposed to an adult blue whale. It's really remarkable. And then at the last stage of this perfect metamorphosis, is that, and the other stage is the pupation, you know, the pupation. And this, is, this case, it happens underground. They dig in soft soil. Most people see hickory horn devils when they're on the ground walking. 
the do-gooders want to put them back in the tree. They think they fell out of the tree. No, they're looking for soft soil to pupate. So most of our moths pupate over the winter, and that's how they get through the winter. <clears throat> well, this shows dramatically. This is Chelsea, my co-author, took this amazing photo. I don't know how she got it, but that's a second instar tobacco hornworm on top of a fully grown one. The first instar would have been a quarter that size. So we're talking thousands of, of times increases in biomass meat basically, for things to eat. I use this, too, for a reason. Some of you in this room this size have killed these. You know it by another name, which isn't really the right name, the tomato hornworm. This is the one that eats your tomato plants. And it's a native moth, a very valuable sphinx moth. Um, they're specialists on nightshades. That family, the tomato's a nightshade. And when we put this buffet out from the old world, they went, went crazy over it. Who would blame them? Um, my advice, if you have these, don't kill them all. I'm going to show you why. Um, set a, just sacrifice some of your tomato plants to them. Fence off the rest or whatever. Um, so this is what they become if they get a chance. They become a large sphinx moth that's very similar to a hummingbird and about that, that size. And, and sphinx are very important pollinators of certain groups of plants. This one's on the non-native 4 o'clock, um, but they certainly pollinate the natives like this. This is one of the rarest orchids in North America, the uh, prairie white-fringed orchid. It's federally threatened. And we have it in Ohio, and we know that sphinx moths are the pollinators of it, the sole pollinators. But no, the literature on which sphinx moth was not very clear. It's probably not very well known. So I got permission to sit out at night and get eaten by mosquitoes. This is late June in this wet prairie where there's a population this is the very plan I was focused on. There's a bunch of other ones around me. I had my camera rig out there. And I'm sitting there like thinking, I'm glad no one can see me out here because this looks like a fool's errand. Nothing's happening. It's getting darker and darker. And then all of a sudden, like a wraith out of the darkness came a moth. And that moth went around to every flower on that plant and all the other flowers around me. It's the pro one of the sole pollinators, and it's the tomato hornworm the one that people kill because they eat their tomatoes. Uh, so they, you know, they perform very valuable functions. A huge number of our orchids are moth pollinated, totally co-evolved with moths to be pollinated. Look at that proboscis. So the trick with orchids, what they do, especially this genus, Platanthra, <clears throat> they have nectar spurs, those long green tubes you can see, and that's where that red tongue is going. Um, and the nectar reward is at the very base of that. So only flying animals, there's no perches here. You can't land on the flower. You have to be able to hover in front of it and have a tongue long enough to go all the way down into that. So they're selecting specifically for sphinx moths is the upshot. So caterpillars, which I've talked a fair bit about and is a really important part of the moth world, um, that phase of their uh, life cycle, they're tube stakes basically running around out there. Everyone wants a piece of them, and a lot of things eat them, birds especially. Uh, the mortality rate is easily 99% in many cases, hence the 700 eggs that moth had to lay that I showed you. Um, <clears throat> everything wants them, though. It's not just birds. This is a caterpillar hunter or fiery searcher. It's a big showy beetle, and it's nocturnal. It comes out. Caterpillars, by the way, are nocturnal. Most of the caterpillar shots I show you here, I took at night. They hide very well during the day, like the moths do. They come out at night, largely to try and avoid that bird predation pressure that they would experience during the day. So the beetle uh, has become nocturnal as well, runs around the trees, finding and eating caterpillars. This is a, I talked about those parasitoid insects that the three-spot caterpillar hits with its football helmets. This is one of them down the right corner. That's a tachinid fly, the tachinidae, that group of flies is utterly massive. There are thousands and thousands of species, many of which prey on caterpillars, often very specialized. She's waiting for a chance. It's a female. She's going to lay eggs on that salt marsh caterpillar, but she's waiting for a chance to get to the hairless underbelly. It's possible the evolution of those long hairs on a lot of caterpillars is to try and keep things like this from laying eggs on your skin. But the fly will probably win. She'll probably get in around to the belly eventually and lay eggs on it, and that'll be its end right there. 
The wasps are epic in this world. Uh, there's a lot of parasitoid wasps that lay eggs on it, like that fly I just showed you. This is a more cheetah-like active hunter. It's a thread-waisted wasp. She just caught that big uh, saddle prominent caterpillar that far outweighs her, stung it instantly when she found it, and paralyzed it with a neurotoxin, so it's alive. If you believe in this stuff, don't karma, or whatever, don't come back as a caterpillar, you know. <laughs> If you were consciously aware of what's about to happen here, you don't want any part of this. So she's got a crypt already made in the sand nearby and she's dragging the victim to the crypt. It's fate to be sealed in with an egg of the wasp and then when junior wasp hatches as a grub, the larvae it has fresh meat. Didn't kill the victim, you know? So that would be no way to go. <clears throat> but it's really, really common. Uh, in this world, these horrible fates, as we would look at it at least. Spiders get on the action in a big way. Uh, a lot of the, you know, the big orb weavers, like your, those yellow garden, black and yellow garden spiders, they catch a lot of moss just incidentally. They're after anything that comes along. Jumping spiders, the little jumping spiders, they're wonderful moth predators. There's even a group of moths that mimics those to perfection, you know, to scare the jumping spiders. They think it's a bigger jumping spider. So there's a lot of pressure from spiders too, but this one takes the cake. This is the epitome of the uh, moth's worst nightmare in the arachnid world. So this is a red bud leaf, and it looks like a blue jay just took a splat on it. It's uh, the consummate bird dropping mimic. I already talked about how prevalent that can be. Uh, when we found it, we knew better. We go, that's not a bird dropping. We go around to the front and we see this wonderful spider. It's this big spider. And we're talking big, it's bigger than two of your thumbnails put together probably. It looks like a little Buddha with the legs tucked around the little crown on the head. It's really cool. So she's hiding in plain sight, waiting for nightfall. And that's when the magic happens. She drops from the leaves and spins this little silken trellis and then drops the fishing line of death here, all right? This little string and it's got like a drop of Elmer's glue on the tip. It's very viscous, it's really sticky. And then the amazing thing is the female spider, there are females that hunt like this, <clears throat> uh, emanates these pseudo pheromones from her body. They ex exactly mirror a small group of moths, males, moths find females through airborne pheromones released by the females. So the moths of those species come swirling in. Hey, they think a girl's over here, you know? They come in, they get close enough, she whips the bolus out and, and catches them on this dewdrop, reels them, eats them. Um, we wouldn't have boa spiders were it not for moths, and a lot of people would say, well, we don't need boa spiders, but some of us think they're cool. <clears throat> So there's these massive migrations, too, of moths. This is a typical moth sheet, by the way, if you're wondering about this. Um, uh, white is the best substrate. I use my white shed wall in my backyard, but oftentimes we hang white sheets up. And then the best lights are um, UV light, black light, and then uh, mer mercury vapor light. Those are, seem to be the types of lights they're most drawn to. So often, that's a mercury vapor light there in the center, and often we have the little purplish uh, black light on the side, and that does a good job. So this was an epic night. We had a lot of moths. This was in a remote part of southern Ohio. It's all forest, you know, very little development, and it was a great night, but as often happens, by midnight or one o'clock, you know, we run out of steam. So we go crash for a couple hours, and then at four o'clock, 4.30 a.m., we come back out to see what happened, and then we clear the sheets off, because flush everyone back into the woods, otherwise the chickadees have a buffet the next morning, and we don't want to doom these things. So anyway, when we came out this night, this very night that sheet was up, uh, we estimated there was 10, 20, 30,000 moths all over the side of the building. The sheet was covered with it. It was remarkable. They were um, armyworm moths, migratory armyworm moths, going over in such mass that weather radar picks these up. They look like storm clouds. It's just epic migrations that occur. Now, I'm going a little farther afield. You have black bears here, lots of them. But out west, um, these migratory armyworms cross the Rockies. And during, when um, daylight comes, they settle in in the scree, the high talus slopes up there, and they get under the rocks on just epic levels. And the grizzly bears have learned this. So the grizzly bears go up there and just start turning rocks over. And it's estimated a hardworking grizzly will eat 40,000 armyworm moths in a day doing this. 
So they're even uh, supporting grizzly bears. Anyway, back, we'll go closer to home though <clears throat> and talk about bats. Um, so down here, there's probably about 15 species of bats and moths are their primary food, followed by beetles. Um, we would not have these moths were, or bats were it not for moths. It's just a really important part of the food chain. There's that red bat I showed you about. And I learned something interesting about this. So red bats start, start showing up from migrations from point south. They winter in the southeast US uh, mostly about early March. Well, there's not a lot of flying insects uh, that time of year. And that's what bats need, as you know. <clears throat> but it turns out there are, all right? And it's spawned by leaf litter. We've all heard, a lot of us at least, have heard this, you know, how important it is to leave your leaf litter if you can do it. Well, that's very true. Leaves have been falling off trees for about 190 million years. And a lot of things have uh, evolved a lifestyle with leaves, not the least of which are the moths. Here's a group that, um, as adults, they roost in leaf litter. Um, that's a uh, spotted Apatolodes moth on the bottom left with two angel moths. Good luck finding these during the day. So that's their roosting habitat. Um, so is this though. This is a common oak moth. I just took this about two weeks ago. Early March, cold weather, they're flying around and they're roosting during the day in the leaf litter. So <clears throat> they overwinter as adults, all right? So they're laying their eggs in early March um, and producing caterpillars, but they're also available. They can fly when it's in the 30s. It's really remarkable how cold tolerant they are. There's the food for the red bats. That's why they're coming back when they do, because there's a bounty of uh, moths in the leaf litter that come out at night, even on cold nights, and fly. So the bat has food. This is another big group of these leaf litter moths, the pinion moths that come out uh, really, really early. They're adult moths in a March or so, they overwinter most of them as moss. This one's on a purple crest, a common spring wildflower. <clears throat> Here's one, it's hard to see. It's a, a major sallow moth. Over the head on the upper left, it's on a, a lichen dappled uh, twig. But the sallows, that's another group. They come out, um, they overwinter as moss and they're out early in March when those red bats come. So they have a lot of moth food and that's what they want. That's why they come back so early. But the reason why these moths probably are adults at that time of year when there isn't, so you think, well, how do they feed? These are all moths that feed. They have to feed on uh, things, and that's usually plants, nectar for moths. These are sap specialists. They, they're sinking their emergence to the uh, maples in large part. But all trees, or most trees, produce sap. So wounds on trees exude sap, and especially that time of year, you know, uh, late winter, early spring. And that's what the moths are there to feed on. They're sap specialists. <clears throat> well, if you are a moth in the bat world, uh, and you're something like this luna moth, this is a male, looks like two ferns are bolted to his head. Um, those are, those uh, have his pheromone receptors. That's how he finds the female. A luna moth can probably pick up pheromone, airborne female pheromones a mile away. It's really remarkable how fine-tuned that is. The rub, though, for the male is he has to go up into the air column to get to the female, and there's the bats. I mean, if you're a bat, this is quite the meal right here. Big, big moth. Um, there's a fresh luna moth, just declosed or emerged. Uh, looks really good, and when people see them for the first time, they often comment on the tail streamers, spectacular. And then, then they'll go, why? Why do they have these tail streamers? And for a long time, it was thought it was camouflage. It helps them blend in, like this one resting in forest understory. And that's probably two to, to a degree, but that's not the main reason they have tail streamers. <clears throat> it's really common to see lunas that look like that. That's all bat damage, fresh bat damage. This has now been shown in a laboratory setting where it was under controlled circumstances. Uh, the wiggling tails in flight of a luna moth attract the bat's echolocation. So we all know bats, they have a sonar. They're pinging sound waves off things. It hits and bounces back to them, and they can exactly fine tune where the subject they're after is. In the case of a luna moth, it pings off the tails that are wildly wagging in flight, and that's what the bat, bat goes for. So the French fry in the middle survives, you know, even though it ripped the tails off, got tail ends of the wings and all that. It's a bat defense. 
This is another case of that, a little cruder. This is a polyphemus moth. I actually saw this happen. It came into the sphere of lights we were working in, and a bat was hot on its heels. It was really cool to watch. A bat was trying to grab the thing right in front of us. But this just has a wildly erratic, almost violently erratic yo-yo flight, and that just makes it hard for the bat to get it. All those pieces out of the wings just happened within three or four minutes of that shot, and then the moth got up under the eaves of the building and was safe theoretically, to go out and still reproduce itself. Bat defense flight. <clears throat> this takes the cake, though. We don't know the half of this. We just, I think, know the tip of the iceberg. But some of the tiger moths, like this dogbane tiger moth, maybe not that species, but other tiger moths have evolved pseudo-echolocation. So all moths have ears, two ears. They hear very well. And that's probably for a bat echolocation. They hear the clicks of the incoming bats. Some moths will drop from the air column as a last stitch when those clicks get too close. Um, what some of the tiger moths can do, though, is when they hear the clicks getting closer and closer and it's imminent, they release a bar barrage of their own sound clicks and jam the bat system. Flies right by. That's really high-tech stuff there. And we'll learn a lot more about that, I'm sure, in time. <clears throat> So night jars and moths, this is another really important um, group of birds um, and with the moth connection. And the best known night jar would be the whippoorwill. I'm sure they're in your fields and woods around here. But we wouldn't have whippoorwills and chuckwills widows with, without moths. It's by far the number one dietary source for them, especially the bigger moths. And this is a group in severe decline. It's getting really hard to find them up my way anymore. And that's because of probably the loss of native flora, consequently the moths. So this is probably the biggest picture thing. If I were to get anything across about food chains involving moth, it would be this scene. This is a big forest, like are so common around here. This one's in southern Ohio, Shawnee State Forest, 70,000 contiguous acres. That is a lot of plant biomass. The majority of North Carolina, at least over on this side, is forest. My state was 95% forest uh, at the time of settlement, and that's true of most of the region our book covers. That is a lot of leaf matter. Birds don't eat leaves, generally. They're not eating leaves. It's this army of moth caterpillars that are converting that leaf plant matter to a digestible source of protein for the animals. They're the interface between the botany and birds, in this case, animals. It just cannot be understated how important that is. Well, if you are a caterpillar trying to eke your living out on the leaves, that would be Freddy Krueger looking in your direction. <laughs> you would not want to see this. And by the way, as a point of comparison for how much caterpillar biomass is out there in late summer, the peak of caterpillar vibrancy, if you will. Uh, if you took all the white-tailed deer in this state, it'd be a lot of them, or my state, and made them a big pile, be a big pile. Somehow, if you could get every single caterpillar in this state and pile those up next to the deer, it'd probably dwarf the deer pile. That's a lot of caterpillars. Anyway, back to the red-eyed vireo. This is the most common bird probably in your state that is a neotropical migrant. They winter in the Amazonian, South America. It's a long-distance migrant. And then return in droves uh, in spring to breed here in these forests and capitalize on this, this temporary bounty of caterpillars, a seasonal bounty of it. Uh, in my state, one million red-eyed vireos colonize Ohio every year to feed on these caterpillars. That's probably 90% of their diets, something like that. Um, very conservatively, those one million red-eyed vireos in a long summer day are, are harvesting 30 million caterpillars, probably more. This is one animal, one bird. And this is on top of all those other insects I told you that eat these. So it's really, really important to vire. We wouldn't have vireos basically, if it weren't for moths. Later come the cuckoos, yellow-billed and black-billed cuckoos, our two species. And they come often, still showing up in June, up my way. They're late migrants, because this is a really big bird. It's bigger than a robin. They don't want dinky caterpillars. They're waiting for the crop to get bigger, bigger caterpillars. Another bird that's probably, what, 80, 90% of its diet, lepidopteran larvae, moths. Uh, warblers, everyone likes warblers. This is one of the worst named warblers. This is the worm-eating warbler, named at a time of entomological ignorance. They're caterpillars. 
This would never be on your wet driveway picking up earthworms. They don't do that. They actually specialize. You see that big spade-like bill for a warbler? They specialize on hanging dead leaf clusters in trees because those are frequently used as bivouacs by hiding caterpillars. And they pry them open and get the caterpillars out. It's the caterpillar eating warbler. Here's a Nashville warbler in transit in northern Ohio in spring from Costa Rica, Guatemala, somewhere in the middle of America is where it wintered on its way to the boreal forest of Canada, feeding on grapes. Wild grapes are incredibly important. They're all native to caterpillar production. And he's prying open a little bivouac that's got a caterpillar and taking it out. Here's a northern perua, the smallest warbler in the east. Um, freshly back in mid-April. Mid They'll be back any time now. And they, it's this beautiful synchronicity with the first emergence of the inchworms the big geometrid family of moths and the inchworms. This is a little bird. It likes little caterpillars like that. And it's there to, to exploit them as soon as they appear in the spring. Cerulean warbler, uh, one of the most declining of our eastern wood warblers. It's imperiled. 80% of the population has disappeared in the last 50 years. It winters in Colombia and Venezuela, Ecuador, down on the uh, slopes of the Andes, long haul migrant. Uh, this was taken in Ohio in late spring, and that's a pinion. Remember I talked about the pinions, the moths come out so early, and so by late spring there's big caterpillars for birds like this deed, and he's got one. Even good vegans like a sparrow, and they are good vegans. As adults they eat very little animal matter, it's mostly vegetation. But when, not when you have chicks in the nest. This is a song sparrow, very common species around here. And he's got four or five of um, prominent moth caterpillars in his bill. And there's a nest of five hungry nestlings just off the picture. And they're all going to get stuffed down their gullets. It's the perfect food for nestling birds. You can't feed them vegetation. They need protein. Well, they, every, all those cuties I just showed you, get, they meet their fate sometimes at the hands of these. This is a Cooper's hawk, sharp shin hawks, or even worse on birds, a juvenile on the left, adult on the right. So you could really argue that if it were not for leaf litter, leaf litter, producing caterpillars, like I showed you, that are out early, feeding the birds I just showed you, you wouldn't have that. Because it eats especially, it eats birds, it eat caterpillars. I mean, there's a lot of connections in this world. You can't avoid. So anyway, moths as pollinators, that was a big part of our book, uh, plants for pollination. And moths are really, really effective pollinators, much more so than butterflies. They're little fuzzballs. Like even the eyes of a lot of moths are fuzzy. So pollen even sticks to the eyes. Butterflies tend to be smoother. They're not nearly as effective at this as moths. And if you want to see this, you've got to go out at night. If you just go to the plants that tend to attract a lot of butterflies during the day, they're going to have even more moths at night. You just need your flashlight to see them. Here's a spotted grass moth on common milkweed. Milkweeds are fantastic uh, nectar sources for many species, like that bold feathered grass moth, also on common milkweed. Here's celery leaf deer on buttonbush. Buttonbush is a wonderful ornamental shrub. It likes wetlands, but it grows just fine in rich soils and be becomes very ornamental. White balls of flowers throughout much of the summer. And white, the, you know, white is probably an adaptation with flowers to our moths. White flowers are really, really effective moth magnets at night. <clears throat> Here's one of the day flying moths. There are some uh, vanishingly scarce compared to the diurnal ones, but that is a uh, yellow colored skate moth. It's a light firefly mimic. Fireflies have a lot of pretty nasty compounds in them, and birds tend to avoid them. So it's probably trying to capitalize on that look, uh, and then it can fly in a day. And that's on mistflower, a common species in the aster family. It's really, really easy to grow, very, very showy. <clears throat> this is the cover of the book, and this was taken in a planted garden. Culver's root is the plant. If you ever find culver's root for sale, snap it up. This is a spectacular, ornamental-looking native plant. Uh, probably not common around here, if at all, but near here it is for sure. And it, uh, that's a zebra conchalotes moth, an incredibly showy moth. And there were five or seven on these plants when I took that photo working them, and a lot of other moths too. There's a cutworm, variegated cutworm. This is a monarda. Any of the monarda mints, you know, wild bergamot is a common name for this one, 
are really, really effective. Long corolla tubes, moths tend to be attracted to flowers with long corolla tubes, but cutworm turns people off. They sell all kinds of toxins to kill cutworms because they eat grass, some of them, turf grass. I'm like, more power to them, you know, I hope. <laughs> but uh, uh, you want cutworms. I'm gonna make a case for this. Cut, they're all native, right? All these things, here, here I'll just say this real quick. We have a war against native species that e eat the Eurasian stuff we brought over here to replace them with. I'm on the side of the natives, personally. Anyway, cutworms are very valuable, and so are armyworms. I taught, here's another cutworm. By the way, this is on a native thistle, pasture thistle. Very few gardeners will deal with thistle. Only the bull gardener will. But oh my god, what a nectar source thistles are. They're covered with butterflies during the day sometimes even more moss at night. So if you're a bull gardener, good luck finding a nursery that sells thistles, though. <clears throat> anyway, here's a typical caterpillar of one of the two moths I just showed you. They're these really big stakes on legs. I mean, really thick, a lot of meat on them. This is the one eating the turf grass and low plants. A lot of the cutworms, armyworms, they're on what they call low plants, things down in the grass level. Um, <clears throat> And they are really, really important food sources for that. So the reason I, bluebirds just love those cutworm and armyworm caterpillars. And a lot of us know bluebirds. I'm staying at a B&B &B down in a, a Tryon, and, and there's bluebirds in the backyard, and they're doing this. I've watched them do this already. So bluebirds are like little thrush hawks. You, they sit on posts, and then they dive down to the ground. A lot of times they're coming up with one of these cutworm or armyworm caterpillars. But what a lot of people don't realize about bluebirds is uh, a third of their diet is caterpillars. They're big, big caterpillar eaters. So we e more easily see this. They're, they're frugivores in the winter, fruit-eating birds, and like American holly like that, and all kinds of other fruits. That's not what they eat in the warm seasons. It's moth caterpillars more than any other food source. Probably beetles are second. So they uh, love to sit on these perches and dive to the ground. A lot of us have seen this, and that's what they're coming up with usually. A good old cutworm caterpillar that they sell poisons to kill. Um, there's one. Uh, this was a cool, it was an old punky fence, you know, fence posts falling apart, old school nesting, and the bluebirds were, they took to that and had nests in them. And, Here's one with a big uh, caterpillar bringing it back to the chicks inside of the fence post. <clears throat> Proof in the pudding. Even the juniors, they got to watch the adults for a while. They got to learn how to do this. And that, a lot of birds, they watch adults to see how they're doing it. And that's what this guy's doing. But they're still bringing them back to him. But soon, he's going to have to do it himself. So one, one core of the book, though, are the um, moss species. We profiled 150, probably all of which are in this state, this area, or virtually all of them. Uh, you know, how do you pick? We had thousands to choose from. So we just chose what we thought were a lot of really cool moss that might pique people's interest. Now, if that thing was the size of a Canada goose, you might not want it in the yard. I can get that. <laughs> But it would fit comfortably on a 50 cent piece or even a quarter. It's a small little moth. A lot of moths are small, but really, really cool. And it eats a variety of plants. It's in the book. That's a moonseed moth, the vine moonseed. Uh, it has its own specialist. Specialization, I should note, is far more common in the moth world than generalization. So a lot of species like that only eat one species or maybe one family. The numbers that eat tons of plants, the generalists, that's very rare comparatively. Here's the caterpillar, another bird dropping mimic. <clears throat> There's an imperial moth who wouldn't want that in their yard. And this is one of the easier silk moths to attract. They like maples especially, but other woody plants. Well, there's the caterpillar, which anyone should consider that an honor to have their maple leaves eaten by that. <clears throat> Here's a white dotted prominent. This is an oak specialist. Oaks support more moth species than any other genus of plants, Quercus. So every good yard should have an oak, at least one of them. Um, anyway, it's a cool moth, you know, but where do you see the caterpillar? <laughs> this is snake mimicry to the nth degree. This is a decent sized caterpillar. So when threatened by like a blue-gray gnat catcher comes up, taps at it or whatever, first thing it does is stick its head up in the air. Those are its mandibles. 
Uh, it bears its mandibles and sways like a cobra. If the bird pushes it farther, it does that. It coils up like a snake and throws its head up over the loop. The mandibles looking like scary snake eyes. This is a visual deterrent against small birds and probably works, you know? I'd probably leave it alone if I was a chickadee. And then there's the Cecropia that we already saw um, in leaf litter with its uh, caterpillar. So anyway, there's a lot of information on those 150 species in the book too, but the, the bread and butter for gardeners is this. We just wanted to get across a lot of really uh, cool plants, all right, and uh, aesthetically pleasing ones. I'm not naive to the gardening circles. You probably are more the choir here. A lot of the groups I speak to, they're more traditional gardeners, and no one's gonna buy a nettle, afraid to say. Nettles produce a lot, but uh, show your stuff sells. Let's put it that way, like that. Oh my God, if you ever get Turk's cap lily, this is an eight foot tall lily with a candelabra of flowers and supports moss, specialist moss. Sedges, sedges are overlooked. The biggest genus of plants in North Carolina is Carex, this genus of sedge. That's true in my state as well, overwhelmingly so. Uh, starting to get into the trade, the nursery trade, and that's a really good thing. We profiled about five of them, what we thought were the coolest. This is my favorite, Buxbaum sedge. It's just an amazingly ornamental sedge, and sedges have a number of moss that are associated with them. Uh, that's for rain gardens. Um, we have some wetland species there. Uh, one of our big hibiscus, native hibiscus. It's incredibly showy and a great supporter of moss. This is broad-leaved arrowhead, another wonderful rain garden plant that produces a number of moss and has showy white flowers in the summertime. Interesting. Uh, smooth beard tongue, um, one of a number of species of beard tongue in this world. This is probably the easiest to grow, um, possibly the best looking though. And then phlox, phlox. Uh, all phlox are good. They have some beautiful phlox I saw for sale out here. They're all good. Phlox are largely driven by moths. They have long corolla tubes and moths and butterflies are big uh, pollinators of them. Uh, if you ever see this species, though, smooth phlox, I know it's down here, it's phlox gliberma, get it. This is an amazing plant, and it should be more in the trade than it is. Uh, asters, too. Uh, smooth aster is for sale. I saw it. I actually bought a couple. Uh, this is um, apples to apples, but I would say it's the prettiest aster there is, if you can find it. Really a gorgeous plant, and all asters look good. And, uh, asters are big producers of moths as well. Little native iris. This one's just starting to flower down here now. The uh, dwarf-crested iris, another good plant. All these have cool moths, too. But you really get into the heavy lifting in the moth world with the woody plants, shrubs and trees. They drive moth diversity more than anything. Sugar maples are wonderful. You just can't beat a sugar maple. Um, and they turn that color in the fall. These Norway maples, especially the ones with purple leaves, you might as well make a concrete tree and paint it and put it there for all the good it does for wildlife. Um, we also have some rose family shrubs. Um, American plums, plums are overlooked. They should be sold more. They're incredibly valuable. I'll just tell you, this isn't a little known thing, but of native habitats, the thicket habitat, these are the original thickets. It would have been in and around prairies and other woodland openings, things like that. Hawthorns and plums and those shrubby, scraggly little plants, vanishingly rare. No one manages for them, no one thinks about them. But the uh, plums are a big part of thicket habitat. This is an American plum, easy to grow. Um, as a byproduct of all the moss that plums produce, this is a Tennessee warbler in spring migration. They're nectivorous. In addition to eating caterpillars, they take nectar from the plum flowers. That yellow on its face, that's all pollen. It's pollinating plums on an epic scale. Little, more needs published on this. Uh, ditto the Cape May warbler. This is in a, just a sea of white plum flowers and it was sticking its face in every one of them, uh, pollinating the plum flowers eating caterpillars of moths, too. So, uh, a lot of simple recipes. If you want to grow specific moss, you know, you need to know what the plants are. We have tons of that in the book, but here's one that everyone likes. People love these hummingbird clear wing moss because they're out in the day and they look like little hummingbirds. And this is one of the two species in this part of the world, the snowberry clear wing, that's nectaring on uh, wild bergamot. And this is the other species, the true, the hummingbird 
clear wing moth. And by the way, if you ever see that plant, plant it, it, native or not down here, get it anyway. I'm not like militant on native all the time. It's native to uh, Eastern North America, the tall larkspur. Oh my God, this is an epic plant. It can get five or six feet tall, covered with flowers. This one had like eight of these hummingbird moths going around it at the same time. It was incredible to see. But to grow those, you have to grow their larvae. It all starts with the larvae, the host plant, as they call it. And these are specialists on honeysuckles, not those nasty non-natives, you know, like amber honeysuckle, native honey, honeysuckles. And there's a good palette of options here. Here's the caterpillar of the snowberry clear wing, the other one, they're very handsome little caterpillars. Uh, but this is one of the best, the viburnums. Native viburnums, any of them. Both species will eat them. This is arrowwood viburnum. It's so easy to grow. Even a brown thumb like me can grow it, and do. And then you're producing both species. Um, they also like this plant, which is probably pretty common around here, the native coral or trumpet honeysuckle. That'll feed both those caterpillars as well. The advantage to this plant is it's got a long flowering period, those beautiful flowers, and the real hummingbirds love them, come to them and then so do the, both of the moths. So if you know the plant, you can grow, grow the fauna that you want. So here's just to summarize, and I won't read that, you can read that yourself, but the big one to me though, uh, as a conservationist, is the middle point. It's just doing this sort of work in your yard, um, is, it just creates a much bigger footprint. You're taking things into your yard and sending it out to the bigger world. You're not a sink anymore, you know, or nothing can live or produce in your yard. Uh, and we want to be sources, not sinks, basically. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.